Hello everybody, uh, my name is Jared Hicken. I am a third year medical student at A.T. Steele University, Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine in Kirksville, Missouri. Um, I am currently completing my clinical rotations or clerkships at Ascension Genesis Hospital in Grand Blanc, Michigan. I'm excited to be sharing with you today a, a brief case um, about a patient that I met on my first rotation um, at Ascension Genesis Hospital and internal medicine rotation. Um, and also talk a little bit about uh, the physiology of this disease. Um, so this is regarding stiff person syndrome. Generally, as a rule, when I'm giving presentations, I don't like it when, um, I don't like when presenters just read off their slides. However, um, given the format of the conference this year, where we are having the conference vir virtually, I'm going to break my own rule a little bit. Um, I will be reading quite a bit off the slides just because I, I don't want anything to be lost in translation. If um, my microphone's not clear or there's any technical difficulties, I still want you to be able to access the slides and see the information there. So with that, we'll jump right in. So the patient was a 65-year-old African-American female with a history of recently diagnosed hypothyroidism and chronic anxiety and depression with psychotic features. Um, she presented to the emergency department with a chief complaint of muscle spasms. She reported the, these spasms had, had been occurring on and off for several months and that they had been increasing in intensity and frequency. Um, she mentioned that the spasms seemed to be triggered by loud noises um, and bright, bright lights. She reports pain essentially diffusely throughout her entire body. And she also reports dysphagia and regurgitation of food um, and liquids, solids and liquids. She had recently been seen for the same complaint at two different hospitals, but obviously as she's presenting to us, um, she, she hadn't found a solution to her problem. So no definitive diagnosis had been reached at that point. Um, on exam, just looking at the patient, she was very diaphoretic and displayed generalized weakness. She looked much older than her stated age. Um, she was quite frail and not able to move around well on her own. Her abdominal muscles were hypertonic diffusely, um, and there were, there were no peritoneal signs or masses, and there were no other musculoskeletal abnormalities that were noted. We ran several lab tests, and here are just a few of the abnormalities that we found. Um, creatinine, or cre creatine kinase was elevated at 372, lactate dehydrogenase elevated at 363, Lactic acid was elevated at 4.50. Um, TSH was elevated up near 13. Um, and she also had a slightly elevated white count. So looking at these labs, not a super clear picture of what's going on. Obviously the TSH is um, elevated, but as we stated, as I stated previously, she had recently been diagnosed with hypothyroidism. So this was not a surprise to us, although she had been she had initiated treatment for this. Um, she hadn't been on the treatment for very long yet. So given the abnormalities in her lab findings um, and the nonspecific nature of the lab findings, she was admitted to the hospital for further workup. Um, we, had, we got several imaging studies for the patient. The first was a chest x-ray, um, which wasn't too exciting. It did not show any evidence of acute cardiopulmonary processes. Um, it was positive for left lower lobe sub-segmental atelectasis and or scarring, uh, we, and we just considered this an incidental finding as it didn't really match um, her clinical picture. We got an x-ray of the abdomen, which showed non-obstructive bowel gas patterns. Um, and as mentioned earlier, she did have that dysphagia, so we initially ordered a, sweet, a speech and swallow study. And when she failed that, we went to the EGD, which revealed sluggish to absent motility of the esophagus. On the third day of her hospital stay, we ordered um, glutamic acid decarboxylase antibody, and that came back very elevated, above 250. So that's the, the highest level that the test would even go to, and she was higher than that. Uh, so given her clinical presentation, along with this finding, this led us to reach the diagnosis of stiff person syndrome.
After the diagnosis was reached, our next concern was to rule out ma malignancy. Stiff person syndrome does present as a perineoplastic syndrome at times, so obviously it's important if you reach this diagnosis to, to rule out malignancy. She uh, got a CT scan of her neck all the way down to her pelvis, and we did not find any signs of malignancy, so our concern for malignancy was minimal after that. After reaching the diagnosis, we initiated treatment um, with tizanidine and diazepam, and we also started a five-day course of IV immunoglobulins. With these, she reported significant improvement. She was, she was thrilled with the outcome, obviously not 100% better. With stiff person syndrome, you can't totally stop the progression of the disease, but treating it appropriately will significantly slow the, the progression and decrease the patient's symptoms. Um, as she was completing the IV immunoglobulin therapy, she was admitted to inpatient rehab where she continued physical therapy and occupational ther therapy before she was uh, discharged home in stable condition. So with this patient, she had obviously been dealing with her symptoms for several months. She had been to two hospitals before us without, um, without getting a correct diagnosis. So I think it's important to ask why that happened, just, just so we can better prevent it in the future. Um, so I especially think it's important because she did have symptoms that were very typical for this disease, for stiff person syndrome. One thing I think that led to the delay was her history of anxiety and depression with psychotic features. Um, it's quite easy to See, uh, see symptoms that are quite abnormal and inexplicable and choke them up to psychiatric causes. I, I definitely think that played a role with this patient. Um, and as mentioned earlier, she had been recently diagnosed with hypothyroidism. Certainly doesn't seem like the typical picture of hypothyroidism, but it is at least a consideration Patients with low thyroid hormone can present with symptoms such as fatigue, arthralgias, and myalgias, which she she certainly certainly had all of those. So although these things seem to 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 explain some of her symptoms, it's also important to note that these are actually quite common comorbidities that are seen along with stiff person syndrome. As far as other things that we did consider. Um, there were many. Here are just a few that I've listed. The first was ankylosing spondylitis. Um, with, with AS, you can also see that truncal stiffness that we saw with our patient. However, there were no radiographic signs of sacroiliitis or spondylitis, which we would have expected if it was ankylosing spondylitis. Tetanus was a consideration given the trunk and limb spasms, but you would also expect also expect to see trismus and or facial spasms, and we did not see those. Parkinson's disease was ruled out based on the physical exam, where we would have expected to see the cogwheel rigidity and resting tremor. We did not see either of those things with our patient. Um, so just as an interesting note with this patient, as mentioned, she displayed the esophageal dysmotility. Um, initially, that kind of just seemed like an unrelated finding that that didn't have to do with the diagnosis, uh, but a little a little further digging found that that wasn't actually the case. Um, a review by Witt et al. looked at 150 cases of stiff person syndrome that were known at the time, and six of those had reported pharyngeal or esophageal dysphagia. Um, they had a patient and they did esophageal manometry on their patient um, to to be the first case to objectively confirm esophageal dysmotility in, an, in a stiff person syndrome patient. Um, this was a significant finding because it suggested that SPS can affect both striated, striated and smooth muscle. Most of the symptoms that are talked about are obviously with skeletal um, striated muscle, but this showed that smooth muscle can be involved as well. So, um, now that we've talked a little bit about the patient, I just want to turn and focus more on stiff person syndrome itself. I think 
Um, this is this is a disease where I'm certainly no expert. When I met this patient, I didn't know anything about stiff person syndrome, but I did uh, try to study it a fair amount with our patient, learn more about this rare disease that that uh, I may never see again. It's fairly rare. That being said, I think it's it is a disease that if we know the basic presentation and the basic findings, it's one that we're not going to miss. So it is a rare autoimmune and or perineoplastic syndrome with a prevalence of approximately one in one million people. It is characterized by progressive muscle rigidity, most commonly occurring in the axial muscles, although rigidity can also occur in the extremities. And in addition to the rigidity, the patient will offer experience intense episodic muscle spasms that may be triggered by loud noises, bright lights, or emotional upset. So you can see already, just based on the based on the basic findings of the disease, our patient was actually a very typical presentation of the disease. Patients with stiff person syndrome are most often positive for antibodies against glutamic acid decarboxylase or GAD. Although more recent studies are finding several other antibodies that are associated with the disease as well, such as antibodies against GABA type A receptor associated protein glycine receptor, and glycine transporter 2. So while antibodies against GAD, GAD are the most commonly seen, they actually are not diagnostic of the disease. However, they can help along with the clinical picture to confirm the diagnosis of stiff person syndrome. Certainly with our patient when we saw the GAD antibodies so elevated that that helped us reassure us that we had reached the correct diagnosis. Um, Anti-GAD antibodies are, again, not always present. One of the um, important times when they are absent is actually with perineoplastic standard stiff person syndrome, which accounts for approximately 10% of the cases. In perineoplastic stiff person syndrome, antibodies against am amphifysin are more common. When you do see stiff person syndrome as a perineoplastic syndrome, it's most likely to occur along with breast cancer or small cell lung cancer. Um, as GAD is the rate limiting enzyme in the synthesis of GABA, it's hypothesized that the presence of anti-GAD antibodies may lead to reduced levels of GABA in the CNS. This reduction in GABA, which is the primary inhibitory ne neurotransmitter in the CNS, would help to explain the common presentation of the disease. Decreased nerve inhibition resulting in increased nerve firing, which leads to muscle rigidity and spasm. So it, it does kind of make sense when you think about the role of GAD in the production of GABA. If, we're, if we have antibodies against GAD, that makes sense that we would have decre decreased GABA and decreased neural inhibition in the CNS, which would lead to increased nerve firing and muscle rigidity. However, it's not actually quite that simple as what has been found. Because studies have shown that the degree of inhibition is independent of GAD titers, which cast doubt on the causative role of these antibodies. If, if it was directly causative, if, for example, our patient had GAD levels greater than 250, if we saw a patient with someone who had levels half that high, you would kind of expect about half as severe of symptoms, but that has not been found to be the case. These are the diagnostic criteria that are used for stiff person syndrome. Uh, these aren't set in stone, they're not official, they're just kind of what has become the generally accepted guidelines. Uh, the first is stiffness in the axial and limb muscles resulting in impairment of ambulation. Second, presence of superimposed episodic spasms that are precipitated by sudden movement, noise, or emotional upset. Third, a positive therapeutic response to oral diazepam or findings of continuous motor unit activity on electromyography that are abolished by intravenous diazepam. And fourth, absence of other neurological disorders that may explain the clinic, clinical features. So again, notice the presence of GAD antibodies is not listed among the diagnostic criteria. It is just a helpful, helpful finding that help, can help confirm the diagnosis. Here's a table of common treatments used in stiff person syndrome. I'm not going to go through this extensively. Um, just point out a couple things. First off, 
you'll notice that a lot of the drugs that are used to treat stiff person syndrome are drugs that modulate GABA and increase GABA's activity in the CNS. You'll also see a lot of immuno immunotherapies used as well, which makes sense given the role of the GAD antibodies in, in stiff person syndrome. So here are my references, sources that I use to gain more information about this rare disease. Again, I'm no expert in it at all. I'm, I'm certainly a beginner when it comes to medicine. Um, that being said, I think this is a, a disease that, although rare, although you may only see it once or maybe not even that in your career, I think it's one that if you have a little familiar familiarity with it, when they show up in your hospital, you're going to recognize it and you're going to know what to do for them. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to share this case and a little bit about stiff person syndrome.